fun moment. All right, well, we are live and ready to go. All right, well, welcome everybody. My name is Jennifer. I am one of the education and outreach specialists here at the Sexual Assault Resource Center. Uh, for those of you that aren't aware, we are a nonprofit agency that serves survivors of sexual violence. So we offer completely free and confidential services to anyone that has been affected by sexual violence in any way. So we have free individual counseling. We also have crisis intervention services. So one of that includes our uh, crisis hotline, which is 24 um, seven. You can call it anytime and ask any questions or if you wanna talk about something, we're here to listen to anything you, you would like to talk about. Um, we also do education and outreach, which is what, what I like to do, That's, that is my thing. Um, basically, ultimately for us to bring awareness to topics around sexual violence, as well as prevention. So we would love to see the rates go down to zero. That's, that's our goal. Of course, that is a really big stretch, but that's our goal in prevention that we, we try to do here at SARC. So just wanna appreciate everyone for tuning in today. Um, this will also be posted on YouTube as well as Facebook as we're done. Um, so you can go back and watch anything that you want or use it as a reference. Um, a couple things just before we get started, I uh, just wanna let everybody know that the comments are not confidential. So if you have a question or a comment that you would like to keep private or something that's a little bit more personal, please call our hotline, which is 979-731-1000. So you can go ahead and call that hotline if there's something a little bit more personal you would rather not have shared on, on Facebook. Um, all right, well, we will get started. Um, so the reason that we're doing this in March is because March is actually Women's History Month. So it is our month dedicated to highlight the often overlooked contributions that women have made to our society. So in 1980, around 1980, um, the president issued the first presidential proclamation declaring the week of March 8 as National Women's History Week. So then it it went on to be Women's History Month. So now that's what we observe today. So women have played a very vital role in science, research, activism, art, and many other fields of work. So they really have contributed to a lot in our society. And while women have made significant progress in equality, there continues to be extremely high rates of violence against women. And that's what we're here to talk about today. So, um, you know, even just to start us off with a couple of statistics that we have, um, over one in three women will experience contact sexual violence, physical violence, and are stalking by an intimate partner during their lifetime. Um, nearly one in six women have experienced stalking in their lifetime, and specifically Native American women are twice as likely to experience sexual violence um, than other races. So, you know, the goal of our discussion today is to bring light of this subject and talk about what it is, bring awareness to it, and also what can we do to make those rates go down? Because as we can see, they're extremely high. And of course, we want to bring those down as much as possible. So we can get started with our discussion today. I would love, we have an, we have amazing panelists. So we're so, I'm so excited to have everybody on here because we were talking a little bit before and there's just such different perspectives. And that's, that's important when talking about a topic like this, because it's, it's complicated, it's complex. So we need perspectives from all over the place so we can ultimately find the goal of trying to find solutions and also just trying to figure out what's going on, how can we fix it. So to get us started, I'm going to have the panelists introduce themselves, talk about, you know, what they do, you know, where they're from, and also why this topic is important in their life or, or in their field and job. So whoever wants to start first, more than welcome. <laughs> Lori, like, uh, hey, Hi, I'm Lori Charles. I'm a clinical assistant professor at Texas A&M in the Center of Excellence for Forensic Nursing. And so within the College of Nursing, I am a registered nurse. I've been a registered nurse for 30 years. And I have been a forensic nurse for 23 of those years. And before I came to A&M, I was running a forensic nursing program in San Antonio. And so forensic nursing is the art and science of, of providing health care to patients who have experienced violence. So either, you know, being physically abused, assaulted, sexually abused or assaulted. Uh, we took care of children um, who we also were concerned maybe had been abused. There was another child in the family 
that was abused. And so we were assessing a child for risk assessment, human trafficking, all of those kinds of things. And then I was able to come to A&M and join this amazing forensic nursing program here. So what we do is we work with the attorney general's office to provide education and training to registered nurses who want to be forensic nurses. And so we provide the statewide training we also do consultation. So when there is a medical problem, somebody it doesn't know how to take care of this patient, they consult with us on that. We've also partnered with the Attorney General's Office to create the Texas Evidence Collection Protocol, which helps medical professionals take care of people or those suspected of uh, violence on others. So that's why I'm on the panel today. Kanice, did you want to go ahead? Sure. Um, hi, my name is Kenise Hoffman. I am the economic empowerment slash economic justice program specialist for the uh, Florida domestic violence program with the Department of Children and Families. Um, I oversee and support um, our 42 sort certified domestic violence centers throughout the state of Florida. Um, we have specific, specific economic justice and economic empowerment programming at 30 of our centers around the state. Um, so what I do is I support them. I provide training, uh, technical assistance, training and support to the entire state um, in regards to financial literacy, financial safety planning. Um, as most of you already know, 99% uh, 90, of domestic violence survivors um, have reported that they have experienced some type of financial abuse or economic abuse within their um, experience with domestic violence. So we know that it's definitely a real issue. One thing that we also try to combat in the best way possible are the economic and systemic barriers that survivors of domestic violence face, whether it's accessing safety net services and navigating various systems. So um, that's why I am on the panel today and that's why I'm so passionate about this work because um, if it affects one person, it affects us all. Um, and so I think a lot of people look at the system and trying to uh, navigate the system as it being those people over there, but we are all a part of the system. Um, and so when you think about it, the system is made up of organizations and what are organizations made up of? Individuals. So that's what I'm really, really passionate about and supporting advocates in the best way possible because uh, I've worked in domestic violence centers and a sexual violence center within Northeast Florida for some time now. And um, I know what it's like to be able to support survivors directly. And so supporting advocates and centers is really important to me to make sure that they can serve survivors in the best way possible. Okay, uh, I'm Katie Ryder. I'm a Lieutenant with the Coalition Police Department uh, here in Texas. Um, as far as, you know, my experience, I've, I've been doing this probably for 20 some odd years at this point. Um, being over the Criminal Investigations Division, that's the detectives essentially, and so they investigate all these crimes on the back end, uh, you know, for the violence against women, whether it's assault family violence or uh, sexual assault or human trafficking or any of those things. And so, you know, I get to see a lot of that on the back end and I get to see, you know, what they go through. I'm also over our victim's advocate uh, that's a part of our division and she's got a lot of resources available to her that she can give to the victims and stuff. And because of all that and the passion that we have for these cases, that's that's part of why I'm on this on this panel is to be able to give that law enforcement uh, perspective. So. All right. Well, thank you again. We are you're so privileged to be able to hear from all you guys today and to be able to learn a little bit more about violence against women and the different perspectives, perspectives that y'all have. So we're going to get started with our discussion today. Um, and again, if you guys are watching this, feel free to, you know, write anything in the comments that you think is right or any opinions you have, you just put them in the comments. Um, but again, they are not confidential. So just if you have any confidential, you can call our hotline as well. So We'll get started with our with our first question. So, uh, women experience crime and violence at exceedingly high rates now more than ever. So, what are some of the crimes that women are specifically experiencing, and how can that affect women's mental health and safety? As far as some of the specific crimes, I, I think it's it's some of the ones that I just mentioned. It's going to be your assault, family violence. It's going to be your your sexual assault, your human trafficking, those type of things. Um, you know, it, it's all of those things affect women's 
mental health and their and their feeling of safety and it, it's it's with the high rates that we have now, it's it's super important that we we look at these a little bit further and we we try to figure out, you know, what can we do to to bring those those numbers down and stuff like that, um, you know. And but but I think our you know part part of our biggest thing that's facing us right now is technology is outfancing us. Um, and I and this may not be the direction you're trying to go with this, but you know, with women experiencing more of these things, I think as te technology has advanced it has grown faster than the laws can keep up. And so people are using technology to prey on women or to, to violate women in different ways that they didn't before. And so I think that's also another reason why the numbers are going up because as we, as we create those laws and we catch up with that stuff, things are getting reported more and more and people are, it's validating for them that that is wrong, that these are things that shouldn't be happening to me. And so part of that goes towards when the laws catch up, it, it helps their mental health a little bit because they realize I'm not insane. This isn't, you know, this isn't right. This is, shouldn't be happening to me. And, you know, it's once we have some of those laws in place, it helps us to be able to answer on the safety side, at least from law enforcement of now we can do something about it legally. Whereas there may be other services, services that y'all can provide that we couldn't before then. So. I, I think Lieutenant is right. All the things are definitely happening. Um, I, I would like to speak to not just to women, it's happening uh, to women, men, people who identify LGBTQ, um, all, all across races, religions, it's happening. But um, when, when somebody experiences violence, that not only um, impacts their mental health and well-being, there's a a huge pocket of research that it also impacts children, it impacts loved ones, um, it impacts us as a community. And, and so um, if people are experiencing violence, it's not just happening to that person and I'm not taking away what is happening to that person and the impact on them and their mental health and well-being. But children in the home, are also seeing it, and and so the you know the butterfly effect, the the one injury on one person has this huge impact on the entire community. I agree. I agree with all of those. And so um, within the work that I do um, or we do within domestic violence specifically, um, one thing that we're seeing is definitely an increase in domestic violence and sexual violence. And within those, there are um, these subsectors such as financial abuse and coercion, especially right now, um, or um, abusers forcing survivors or um, the family as, as a whole um, into substance abuse or substance use or misuse, um, withholding medication, gaslighting, um, economic abuse that, you know, where they're interfering with them, their ability to be able to work from home or um, maybe even the children, something as simple as logging on for school at a certain time. Maybe the abuser has kept them up all night. And so just as Lori and Katie both said, it's impacting families as a whole, it's impacting the children um, and not just that survivor. And so um, we like to refer the family members or someone who may be impacted as well as co-survivors. Um, and so with that, one thing that we're seeing is we're seeing more substance use disorders. We're seeing survivors feeling like they have a loss of agency as a whole. And so we know that survivors, their mental health can be weaponized by that abuser. Um, and it's used as another form of violence within itself. And so if that abuser is, you know, talking about, you know, leaving or even thinking about leaving or something as or something as simple as being able to access law enforcement previously, if they needed help, um, or being able to access medical support or medical uh, a medical provider as needed, where the medical provider would identify or see the fact that something was wrong, or maybe if the children were in school and now they're not, and you know teachers are the first ones to notice that something isn't right with that child who usually comes in happy, or uh, maybe they're not wanting to celebrate their birthday today, or maybe they have a few extra bruises on their body, but they're not seeing that right now. So. We're seeing it in all different areas right now, especially when it comes down to the mental health side of things. And, um, and even we know with, you know, mental health, we know that it can impact things such as their physical well-being as well. So, you know, um, gastro issues, 
um, you know, back pain that you didn't have before. And it didn't come from, you know, may not have come from something physical. Um, so all of these things are things that we're seeing and it's more prevalent now. Um, and so that's why even with my friends and my colleagues, when people are accessing or reaching out for mental support or maybe some type uh, sort of resources, as they're reaching out for mental support or mental health resources, they're not able to access them because there's such a long waiting list. Um, just for something as, you know, as simple as counseling, that can be, um, you know, a huge, huge support for survivors, for anyone really. And so those things, it's, it's much harder right now. So it's definitely taking a toll on survivors as a whole. I think that the impact of the pandemic, um, again, that butterfly effect is going to be absolutely immense because all of us are not okay right now. <laughs> We're just not. Um, and I am not experiencing violence in the home, and but I'm not okay. And so just having the pandemic, stress and anxiety, and people are out of jobs, they might not be able to go to work, they might have to worry about childcare, homeschooling, there are so many things that are piling on that increase stress at home. And that increased stress at home, um, people that don't have impulse control can lash out and hurt people in their home. And um, exactly like you spoke of earlier that, you know, the teachers aren't seeing the kids if the kids are being homeschooled. And so those outside people that could potentially report these instances aren't able to lay eyes on people and so can't necessarily report. And so that is where my concern lies or people who are experiencing violence if, if their abuser is at home with them 24 hours a day, how on earth are they supposed to get help? And, you know, I've seen a couple really amazing, brilliant things online about ordering, you know, calling 911 and ordering a pizza. You know, that is a great way to ask for help The you know, this sign um, asking for help, those kinds of things uh, are happening. But does the world know that to recognize, hey, I need to do something about this situation? Lori, you actually, that's a perfect segue into our next question. Perfect. Um, yeah, and I, I just want to go, go back and say, you know, what you guys said, I validate that everything is so true, especially with the technology. Um, that, that I didn't think about first was the technology and the laws actually catching up with what's happening and how fast children are online and everything. And I mean, I, I grew up with cell phones and I knew that pretty young, but I mean, children who grow up from iPads when they were born, that kind of thing, they're going to have this whole other world that I don't even understand. And I still consider myself pretty young. I don't, I should know these things and I don't. So it's interesting how those laws are going to be catching up. And I have seen some recent, I know in 2019, um, I forgot which one it was, but you know, unsolicited sexually explicit pictures, sending those are now, you have to have that consent, which is so, so important. And that's another form of sexual harassment that could be on women, men, anybody that experiences it. So I think that's a really, really great, great point. But talking about the pandemic and what's going on right now, um, perfect segue into what our next question is. So Violence against women has shown to increase during natural disasters, times of high stress and unforeseen circumstances. So in what ways has the pandemic affected women's experiences with domestic violence, sexual violence and human trafficking, which we know, we know that it has. And we've seen the numbers and we've seen, we've talked to um, you know the domestic violence shelters in town and everything. And we've, we know that the numbers are going up. So how, how do you think that has affected women's experiences specifically? I think, I, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know that that, I can't specifically say the numbers have gone up. What I have seen personally is that um, the acuity is going up. And what I mean is the physical injuries are so much more extensive than we, we've seen in the past. Well, so to speak to the numbers and stuff, um, obviously I can only talk about College Station. Um, we had them pull the numbers and just from 2019 to 2020, we saw a 15% increase in violence against women. And so, and that, that covers all the, the three crimes that I talked about earlier in particular. Um, but, you know, as far as the pandemic and stuff, I think you were right on the nose when you're talking about the stress and the anxiety and everything that builds up when people are stuck at home. Because anecdotally, I can tell you, 
that even when it's a holiday weekend and it's just like one extra day on a weekend, you know, when I was on patrol, it was, it was always this, well, you know, crap, essentially, this is, it's going to be one of those weekends because everybody's been stuck in the house for three days together, whereas they're only used to two days being together on a weekend and they have that extra day that they, they get tired of each other. They get, you know, they, they see that, or they have that environment that gets extended longer than normal. And now here we are in this pandemic where it's been going on for months. And so this has been building and building and it is, it, we are gonna see that fallout for a long time uh, on that side of thing. And, you know, as far as on the back end, the other thing that, that's happened with resources are limited. You know, as far as the capacity in our shelters to be able to take women to shelters, they're operating at half capacity. There are, you know, it's policies for the different agencies, like for our agency, you know, during the height of the pandemic, you know, people weren't allowed to go out to the hospital to respond, whether it was our victim's advocate or whoever, to help assist with with these calls and try to get people where they needed to be. And I know at least with SARC or with some of these other uh, agencies, they're doing a lot of services counseling online now, whereas before there was the face-to-face contact and there was that ability to to actually connect more with people. And so I think those are all some of the things that you're seeing as a result of the pandemic and and that are making it more difficult. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right there with you on there, Katie. Um, Because specifically here in Florida, we saw numbers rise about seven to eight percent. And that's just people sharing that information with us, not the ones who don't. And so I'm sure our numbers are probably right there with you in Texas. Um, And so one thing that we've seen in regards to lockdowns and pandemic related, um, just like the economic impacts have, they've they've really just been magnified. Things that were already there, those factors that were already there um, have really just been magnified altogether. And so of course there are typically associated with some kind of domestic violence or DV. Um, And so we've seen things increase such as, you know, male unemployment um, and and stresses associated with uh, childcare and homeschooling and really that increased financial insecurity. And so Katie, just as you spoke about, um, you know, when those weekends are a little bit longer, you know that there's going to, it's just going to be one of those weekends. And so uh, back in 2013, 2014, I worked at one of our, our certified sexual violence uh, center here in Jacksonville. And so we knew, and it's still the same to this day, we knew that Florida Georgia weekend would be that week. It would be that yeah. weekend for us. It falls right on holiday, uh, right in on Halloween. And so it's about a three day window where we know that the, our sexual violence center or our rape crisis center, we're literally going to have a call every single hour re- responding to in our law enforcement uh, team. They were just, at, they were, you know, so overwhelmed. And so we're trying to support them the best way as possible as well, while these survivors are coming in the door one after the other. And that's not even um, considering the calls that are coming in or, um, you know, what law enforcement is seeing or what the sensors are seeing on their crisis lines or people that aren't coming in for services, you know, the moment that it happens. So that's something that we definitely have taken a, uh, taken a, um, a, a look at here recently. And we're still trying to study that at this time. Um, even the increase in our uh, hotline for statewide services. Um, our legal hotline as well. So we have a legal hotline and we have a statewide domestic violence hotline as well. So with that, we've seen the numbers increase where we're having to have multiple people on a call at one time and, you know, reaching out for backup and more help. Um, And so with that, it's because people are there in that space where we already know that when it comes down to financial insecurity or um, a lack of resources or our shelters not being able, like you said, to run at full capacity all of these things are so, so difficult right now. Mm-hmm. And so one thing that we want to remind survivors that may be listening today is that continue to reach out to us. Whatever, mm-hmm. whatever we can do, whatever um, is within our ability to do, we are going to do whatever we can. If the yes. thing that we have seen is we've seen now an increase in resources, financial resources and things that we can maybe reach out for, um, whether our shelters are full and we are at full capacity, if that means reaching out to um, you know, local hotels or local housing uh, centers or um, local um, homeless shelters, even if it's just temporary, we're gonna do whatever we can, even if that means just safety planning with you over the phone until we can get you out of that situation into a safe space. Um, but I second everything that you both have said so far. Another thing that, thank you, I thought that was incredible information. I, as, we, as you were speaking, I started thinking about, I wonder about the alcohol delivery. Mm-hmm. 
So in the middle of the pandemic, that was one of the things that changed is that, you know, there's alcohol delivery services now, and we all know that alcohol and drugs, uh, when people aren't, you know, functioning in their normal mind, that that lowers, um, it lowers their inhibitions. And so does that make them more likely to uh, lash out and hurt somebody? So I'm, I'm wondering... You know, I think there's going to be layers and layers of issues when we look back at this pandemic and what it did to people's mental health, but also um, how it increased the, the stress and therefore abuse of others. Yes, I think, I think you're right on, Laura. That's a really interesting point that I didn't, I didn't even think about, but I, it, when, once, you know, once we're out of this and, you know, a couple of years down the line, when we start doing that research on how this affected everybody, and that's going to probably come for years and years and years, it's going to be interesting to really find those small, you know, connections that we wouldn't have normally thought of before. So that will definitely be interesting. I can, I can also say on the, you know, Sark side of things on, you know, our center, we've experienced definitely a, um, a lot more clients needing mental health services and needing crisis intervention and all of that. And so we've had to hire actually two new counselors to try to keep up with those numbers. But of course, you know, more resources are needed. Always, always. Even if, even if there's enough, I think more resources are always, always needed. So I can just say that on our side of things, it's, we've definitely seen, seen a difference and a, a rise in numbers for sure. But I think um, we're reacting in a great way, right? I think we're using telehealth, um, we're, we're using our technology while, you know, perpetrators can use technology for bad. We're using our technology for good to try to reach out and connect and um, just make sure that, that people understand that there is help um, and, and we can do things a little bit different than we used to do things. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of adjusting for sure. I think anyone in their life has had to adjust. So I think it's, 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 it is a cool and very positive thing that centers and advocates have been able to adjust the way that they are helping survivors. So I think that is super interesting. <clears throat> um, so that brings us to our next question. Um, statistics show that many assaults are underreported or not reported at all. <clears throat> Excuse me. Why do you think this is? And also, do you believe that survivors are more or less comfortable reporting uh, or seeking help? And kind of it's a three pointer question. What do you think can be done to make survivors feel more comfortable to report? Kind of a three point. <laughs> um, definitely, you know, I have the analogy of, you know, do you sit down with your close friend and talk about, you know, intimate relationships with others? No. And so how on earth can we expect people to talk about um, something that happened to them that where their power and control was taken away and things were done without their consent. And so um, from a forensic nurse point of view, having trauma-informed patient-centered care. And what I mean by patient-centered is I'm not the boss. I'm a strong, powerful, registered nurse woman, <laughs> but I'm not the boss in that room. The patient is the boss and they make the decisions. Now, my role is to educate them so that they can make whatever decisions they need to make for, for themselves and their situation. And then I'm going to honor those decisions. And um, so I, I think that's really, really important for people to hear. And so that's why the education of the forensic nurses is important because what I say in that initial contact with somebody who's experienced violence, what I do, how I act impacts how they're going to, um, how, how this sexual violence is going to impact the rest of their life. And so it's really important that I do my job well, and my job is educating forensic nurses so they can have that great response for people who've experienced sexual violence. Um, so kind of take it in maybe in a little different direction. Um, the question you know, revolved around uh, uh, incidents of violence being underreported and, and why do we think that is? Um, 
and and maybe I'm off target on this. I think part of it, some of it's going to be cultural issues. I think some of it's going to be family dynamics. Um, and I think even sometimes media is going to play a role in how people, people feel about law enforcement and um, and what is socially acceptable to, to do or to report. And I think some of those things make it difficult for people to feel it's okay to reach out to law enforcement and to report things to us. I think some of it also comes down to maybe a lack of knowledge of how the system works and what's actually gonna happen. And the, you know, the process, what it looks like and, and those kinds of things along the way. Um, and if they don't feel comfortable talking to law enforcement, I, I understand because of all of those reasons, right? Um, feel free to reach out. You don't have to file a report. You can always call and ask questions. Even in our department, we have a, a crime victims advocate, Anna Lee, who is awesome at what she does and she is a civilian and she can answer those questions in a non-threatening manner and be able to walk people through and guide them through, through those things. And so I'm sure, you know, whatever agency that is in your area, they have some kind of equivalent or somebody who can point you to the right resources. And so even if you don't reach out to law enforcement, I encourage you to talk to somebody do what you can to get out of that situation. Yeah, and so um, I love what both of you said. Um, and so even just kind of piggybacking off of what Katie just said a moment ago. Um, in re so one thing that we did when I worked at the, the, uh, the Sexual Violence Center, the Rape Crisis Center here in Jacksonville, um, we, there was this new project, they had new funding for it. And so what they did was they realized, and this might kind of go into the next question as well, but what they realized and what they saw was that um, within the urban core community within Jacksonville, Florida, um, even though it was a high risk area, they were, it was an underserved population um, or maybe even unserved um, population. We knew that everything that was considered bad, their rates were really high in that community. So we knew that domestic violence was really high. We knew that sexual violence was really high, but people weren't accessing services and we weren't quite sure why. So what we did was we paused for a moment um, and we went into the community and we, re we had a conversation. We talked to the people within the community. We wanted to talk to survivors in the community. We want to talk to people that were serving that community. So law enforcement, uh, legal systems, uh, safety net partners, stakeholders within that community to find out what's the disconnect and how can we make sure that we are um, making ourselves available. So what we found out after having a focus group with the survivors of that community is the reason that they weren't accessing services is something as simple as we were across the bridge. And it literally took them to go downtown to the hub and catch another bus from wherever they were to get across the bridge. And we were literally the first stop once you went across the bridge. And so no one knew that. What they saw was during that time, they saw that they had, we had flyers that had like, you know, those like purple hands or like teal hands that are like on there. Um, or it's maybe like a group of people like holding hands in a circle. Um, the marketing materials were too wordy. Um, and just as Katie said a second ago, there was um, this, it was almost um, a misunderstanding of what the process actually was. So um, they didn't know that there were sane nurses that could hold their hand and walk them through that process and would be gentle um, and not just, um, you know, at some random, you know, sketchy clinic. They didn't know that um, if they wanted to make a report to that officer, that that officer could also drive them to that facility and wait with them until it was done and then take their report. Um, they didn't know that they could receive medical treatment without having to go through, um, you know, the reporting process. So again, it was that misunderstanding or misinformation of things that they may have been told previously. And so um, I'll talk about a little bit more in a, in a little while, but those were some of the things that we realized that people just weren't accessing services because of that. Or maybe they thought that um, they had to, you know, report and go through the entire process. They didn't know about relocation assistance that some, you know, that someone could assist them in relocating, and they can have an advocate with them to walk them through that entire process, and that it was up to them, and they could decide what was best for their situation and their mm -hmm. life. And so those were things that we had to sit down and have those tough conversations to figure out 
what were we doing as an agency to make, to make it to where survivors felt like they couldn't reach out to us. And so even in that, we were able to talk to law enforcement and provide them with certain trainings. And those officers were also people that knew the community very well. They knew Johnny on the street corner and they were gonna talk to him every single day. And if Johnny wasn't there, then something was wrong. You know, they knew that she and her five kids are going to get off this bus right here and they're going to walk home. And if they didn't see them at a certain time, something was wrong. And so those are things that they knew, but they didn't ever talk about things such as sexual violence or domestic violence because it was a taboo topic. And so once we realized and started building that community within that area, once we started coming from behind our desk and from across the bridge and offering uh, office hours within their community, um, you know, the officers are also in the kids' school. They're playing basketball with them, so they know the family. And so um, when they saw the same nurses weren't like these scary people that were just there to check off a list, but that they were going to be able to be gentle and talk to them through the process and connect them with resources that would help them and make sure that they were okay and that they were taking their lead as far as whatever that survivor wanted to do, that changed the game totally. And our numbers skyrocketed, not because it was happening more, but because it was already happening and people were reaching out for help and support. So that's, that's that piece. Thank you for saying that because I think you know, uh, are we are we too strongly putting the onus on the person who's experienced the violence to reach out for help? Um, if they don't know help exists, how is somebody supposed to reach out for help? And I've had so many patients that like, I did not know you guys were here until I needed you. Um, but I also think that that law enforcement, do, you, do I have to report or not report thing? I think that is important. That, that people know in the state of Texas, and it's several other states now, but in the state of Texas, if uh, an adult survivor wishes to have a sexual assault exam with evidence collected, they can. And we do not notify law enforcement um, if they do not want that done. And then that evidence can be stored now for five full years. And that gives the survivor time to um, let all of those hormones that they've had this hormone flood from being uh, sexually assaulted or injured, let that flood go away. That takes days. Um, and then maybe they can sit down and decide what I want to do. Do I want to report or not report? And then the evidence has been collected and that's already kept safe. And then they can come back and go, yes, I do want to involve law enforcement. And then they can call a lieutenant and say, hey, I had evidence collected. It was a few days ago. And then she can start the investigation. And, and so I think that is one of the really amazing laws that, that have happened relatively recently in the state of Texas that people might not know about. Yes, Lori, I can even say from the education side of things, um, when I'm talking to students or talking to different, you know, community members too that have lived here their whole life, they they have no idea of the yeah. services that are offered here. Yeah. So I think I think education and awareness is one of the most and access is one of the most important things because somebody who lives, oh, we cover the seven counties, so we do cover a pretty wide area, but people who are in the rural counties who, you know, live in those those outer counties, they might not even know that we exist because they are not right next to us. They don't see our flyers that we do have. They don't see our social media. Maybe they don't have social media. There's so many different access points that we might not be hitting. So I think that is incredible that you guys did that. I think that all centers should be doing things like that to ask those questions that can ultimately help survivors and help people get all of the support that they could get um, for free for all these services that are offered in our community that people just might not, might not know about. And if you can't, if you can't get in, call anyway, and maybe we can help you get, mm -hmm. I can understand that. And we had, when I was in San Antonio, we had patients, the rape crisis center was in the lower South side. And if you lived on the Northeast side, that I, I don't even know how many bus transfers that was to get to the center. And so call and uh, we will work with you so we can get you care. Mm -hmm. That's one of the one good things about being virtual for, for counseling is we might be able to reach those people that aren't able to drive here. But there is another downside of people that may not have internet or may not have the funds to have a computer 
or may not even be in a safe situation. So there's, there's some pros and cons for sure, but some right. of the pros is that we're able to reach those people that wouldn't want to drive 45 minutes to get into town if they live in one of those, one of the outer counties. So yeah, very, very interesting. So, uh, so we'll have the next question here um, in disenfranchised and marginalized communities, for example, um, black, indigenous, people of color, LGBTQ+, disability, um, legal status immigrant, and, and so on, many more, um, you know, women experience similar or higher rates of violence and crime in addition to experiencing other social and racial inequities or issues. So what are some of the barriers that these individuals can experience within your pro uh, professions? So I, I guess I'll start this off, um, at least for law enforcement on, on us, we're gonna investigate every case that comes to us based on the merits of the case, you know, the facts, the circumstances, everything. So we try to treat all the cases equally, uh, as equally as it can. But I think kind of some of what more you're getting into is, is maybe why they don't come and report those or why they don't come to law enforcement in the first place. And, and so it kind of goes a little bit back to the, the previous thing where we're talking about some of that cultural dynamics and the family, you know, the family dynamics, cultural issues and those kind of things. But I think the thing, that would help more on our end is people are always more comfortable talking to somebody that they can identify with. And whether it is, you know, somebody of the same gender, somebody of the same race, somebody of, of the same identity, whatever it is, you know, we need to be more representative of the demographics in the communities that we serve. And so, you know, we're always trying to diversify and get people from different walks of life. And some of that's hard though, because the social perception right now is it's it's not cool to be in law enforcement, if that makes sense. And so we're trying to overcome that and, and to get people to come into the department and, and help serve and protect their communities. And because that's the way to build that that trust and to build into, you know, those ties to the community is if, if we can draw from within our own communities to be law enforcement and, and help overcome those barriers that people feel are there. You know, from, from my, my point of view, um, you know, I mostly took care of children and um, people don't, people oftentimes are, are scared of law enforcement and may not teach their children that law enforcement are safe people. And so, you know, I'm building rapport with my patient that I've never met before. And, uh, you know, once you sit down and play with a child and, and you hear their their history of what happened to them, you examine them and they realize this is a safe person. I can potentially extend that safety to another person. And so this is my dear friend, officer so-and-so. I may have never met this person in my life, but this is my dear friend, officer so-and-so and officer so-and-so is here to listen to what happened to you. And so could you please tell them what happened to you? And so I can kind of help build that bridge. So that patient, um, maybe <laughs> can start feeling comfortable with law enforcement to, to talk about uh, what happened. But that, that is my experience as I, I see patients who are very anxious with to law enforcement. Um, so along with that, and yeah, everything that y'all said, and I, I second that. Um, and so with that, um, one thing that as a woman of color, um, one thing that I can say is that um, survivors, most of the time, they identify with someone who looks like them. So um, one of the barriers that we heard from survivors within the urban core, um, and it was just in regards to sexual violence, is that no one in the office looks like them. And so I was newly hired. I'm excited to be there. I'm like, I'm gonna go change the world. I'm gonna save everybody. Um, but at that time, the people that they were seeing, no one looked like them. Yes, they were doing support groups, but no one looked like them. And so um, typically if you see someone, so if I'm a basketball player, I'm going to gravitate towards the athletes in the room. Um, and just as a woman of color, if I see someone, if I can go and sit down with someone, I can talk about things that 
maybe you will also understand as I'm talking, even though you may be someone who is sincerely there to help me and support me in the best way possible. But at this moment, I'm thinking, okay, well, what do you know about my situation? Same with I'm 30 years old. So um, when I first started, I was in my early 20s. And so I have women who may be older who were 65 mm -hmm. to talk to me. And they're looking at me like, give me somebody who has some experience, <laughs> a little bit of seasoning, because you're not it. And so and they didn't mean anything harsh by that or, or mean by that or cruel by that, but they were sincerely saying, I can't do this. And so with that one thing that we understood is that they needed someone who looked like them. Um, if you were in a community where um, most of the people are Spanish speaking as their first language, then we need to have people within that community or within that organization who also are not every single person, not 90% of the people are having to call and do it on a language line or having a translator come in or saying, okay, well, let's wait for so-and-so to get on the shift because that makes it harder. And so when people think about systems, just like I said earlier, we are a part of those systems. So people think of the system as like court, they think of the system as just law enforcement. No, we're a part of that system too. And so um, if our organizations, if our centers don't reflect that, and if we're not, um, culturally responsive, um, if we are thinking that, you know, we know everything or we're culturally competent, we have it all figured out. We, I've went through the training, I get it. Okay, well, let's take a moment. Um, so having things within your organization that's welcoming to someone. So if I have a domestic violence center and someone comes in and I only have salt and pepper in the cupboards, but I don't have any adobo seasoning, if I have uh, the little cute shampoos that are donated from the hotels, that's like a little suave, but I don't have something like a relaxer, or if I have one of those yearbook hair brushes or combs they used to give us for like picture day, I can't do anything with that little comb. That's cute, but I need a hairbrush for my hair. So when it comes to things like that, our organizations have to also make sure that we're being culturally responsive. And it's not always the organization's fault that they can't hire people in that area because maybe no one's applying. Maybe they're not quite qualifying and we don't want to just hire a token person, right? Mm -hmm. So what we can do is we can reach out to those survivors, reach out to the community, hold, um, hold meetings, hold focus groups and say, what can we do better? We want to give you a list of things we have, donations that we're receiving. What can we do better? It may be something as simple as having a support group for individuals who identify as LGBTQ+. It may be something as simple as having a support group for people that are 65 and older. And so it's not always just underserved, but sometimes it's inadequate, inadequate uh, not served adequately. Um, sometimes it's being unserved altogether. And there are probably populations that we're just not reaching. So the thing is we have to take a moment and look at our organizations as a whole and see what are we doing and how can we be better all the time. And it's an ongoing thing where we're always learning. We're never quite there. Every single day we have to make sure we're taking a step back and realizing, hey, at the end of the day, I get to go home. I come in here with an education. I come in here with experience. I have a certain level of privilege. How can I work with the people that I'm serving in the best way possible to make sure I'm meeting whatever those barriers are? So not just saying, oh, I serve everyone the same or I don't see color, or not just saying it doesn't matter what, um, you know, how you identify, um, you know, within your gender, how you identify um, within your sexuality, not saying that, but saying, I see you, I recognize that, I honor you, and I want to see how I can serve you in the best way possible. So even if it's, um, you know, uh, a distrust within the legal system. Where did that come from? It came from somewhere. And so even when it comes to like medical providers, we know that uh, women of color have higher rates for the same things of dying just in maternal health. And so, um, or even something as recent as two weeks ago, I saw where um, a medical student was saying that they were told within their class, and they challenged the professor in the class, but they were told within their medical class um, that black people, because of their because uh, of their melanin, they have thicker skin, and they uh, the pain tolerance is higher. And so those are things that are still taught to this day. I have friends that are pregnant, and um, and they're really close <laughs> to to their due dates, and they were told literally on the table while they're being examined, oh, you'll be fine. And they were told the same thing. 
And so these are things that we're hearing and when people hear it, they're like, no, you weren't told that. I'm like, yes, yes, I was. So when they're not accessing services, it's not, it's typically not something they just made up. It's something that we're going to, as service providers, as a part of the system, actively work to tear down and break down and show them that we're here to offer any kind of services that we have, no matter who they are. And then making yeah. sure that they're saying, it doesn't matter who, we're going to serve you all the same. Nope. We're going to serve this individual according to what they need. Um, just as Lori was saying a second ago, we have to make sure that all of our services are survivor centered and that yeah. You know, calling the plays. And one thing I used to say as an advocate is you're the quarterback, you call the plays, and we're going to run them. You let me know what you want called, and we're going to make it happen. You have a team of support around you. You let us know how we're running this, and we're happy to do it. And yeah. we have to make sure we're giving people uh, that space, that safety, building that rapport with them so they understand that they can trust us as well. Absolutely. And I'll have patients that will kind of test me just to make sure that I'm telling them the truth. And they'll say, well, what if I say no? Then, then I'm going to ask you, can I, can I understand why you say no? And walk me through that. And maybe I can help allay fears. Maybe they think I'm doing things to them without their consent. Um, you know, there, there's a reason people believe things, you know, the Tuskegee Airmen. I mean, th there's a reason. And so there, there's a reason we're seeing people of color taking the, the um, COVID vaccine at lower rates. There's a history, there's a reason. And, and so education and being in this place to say, can I answer those questions for you? And if I don't know the answer, I'm gonna find somebody who does. Um, I, yeah, I just agree with what everybody says. I think, I think those are all such, such amazing points. I think even talking about the aspect of giving them the control because I know that I'm not gonna say, I, I understand your life completely because I'm a, a white woman. I, I grew up fairly privileged and I know that. So I'm not gonna tell this person, oh, I, I know what you, this is what you need. Cause it's gonna be probably a lot different than what they want or what they need in that moment. So giving them the control, I like that. I'm, I might take that. I might take that quarterback thing. Cause that's, that's, it's really important for them to know that they are going to be supported in the way that they need to be supported in that mm -hmm. moment and what they need. So I think, I think that is wonderful. Yeah, um, this may be the first time that a lot of them are having that control or getting that sense of power. And so to be able to give someone that sense of power and not that we took it from them, but to reassure them that they have that and that this right here is their space. This right here, um, our centers don't belong to us. They're there for the community. They're there for the centers. They're, or they're there for the community. They're there for survivors. And so with that, this may be the first time they have that or that they feel that. And then also <laughs> when they don't know what to do with it, like, well, I don't know. And they kind of sit back. It's okay to let them sit in that for a second because it's maybe the first time they they felt that before. And so really just kind of honoring that and, and being willing, as Lori said, like, if I don't have the answer, I'm going to go find out for you. Um, you know, no matter what that is. If someone says, I prefer someone that's a little bit more seasoned within this work, I'm going to take a moment. I'm like, not a problem. Let me see what I can do to help you and assist you in the best way possible. So I, I'd love this conversation. Yeah, especially with people who have a history of experiencing sexual violence, domestic violence, human trafficking, that is all about them not having control. And so just giving in, in that aspect too, giving them that control back is is probably the first time yeah, they've ever experiening that, especially with the trauma that they've been through um, on top of racial trauma that they have also most likely been through as well. So definitely amazing conversation. That's why I was so excited to have everybody on here because I knew I knew this was going to be a wonderful conversation. So that moves us to our last discussion question tonight. Um, and this is kind of a, a wrap up question. And so you can kind of add on whatever you guys want to this as well. Um, so, you know, with the recent attention on sexual harassment, gender based crimes, violence against women, um, individuals are looking for a solution to end the violence. Um, in your opinion, what needs to be done or changed by professionals, individuals to ultimately decrease these rates of violence against women? So we kind of touched on it a little bit, but just kind of a wrap up and kind of any other thoughts that you guys have about, about this topic. So at least on, you know, on law enforcement side of things, you know, for us, we really need to build up our victim services program and make it a little bit more robust than it is and stuff so that, 
you know, we can go out and, and, and meet with the community and have some of those more, more one-on-one -on -one type of talks and, and really uh, let people understand that it's not about making the arrests, it's about, it's about the people and that we care what happens to the people. And it's more important that they get the help that they need than it is necessarily that we make, always make that case, right? You know, because if, if they're worried about reporting it or not, it's more about getting them the help they need. So it's that, and, and it's, it's going into the education side of things, you know, and doing those outreach and that kind of stuff. But when we do the education, it's keeping, keeping the politics and keeping the religion out of it so that you don't turn off any potential audiences or anybody who needs to hear the message because you bring in those two things, you know, specific people on either side or whatever side it is, you're, it's polarizing and, and people don't always wanna hear it and they, they, they miss the message for all the other fluff that's going on around it, if that makes sense. And so, you know, I, I think you, you do those things and, and you build in some of the outreach, you know, whether it's outreach to the community or it's, it's, it's you know, having the, the programs where, like at our department, we've, we've started in January, we have a CPS investigator who comes and works out of our office at least once a week. And so we're able to directly talk to them about cases, you know, involving children and things like that, you know, to, to, to build those relationships and help cases get processed faster and, and resolved in the right manner. And we're trying, we're in negotiations now to try to do the same thing with our district attorney's office. So for whether it's for family violence or, or anything else, you know, in those kind of cases and to try to build up our, our program and our services that way. So. I think education is definitely the key. Um, and to, to what Katie said, uh, in the Children's Advocacy Center in San Antonio, that, that is what they did. They had law enforcement, child protective services, district attorney's office, medical providers, social, social services, all in one building. And when we're all together, then I can walk down the hall and say, hey, I have this situation and I just don't know what to do. And when you start building those relationships, then I feel safe to go into Katie's office and go, I have no idea how to handle this. And I need your law enforcement lens. And maybe she knows something that I don't know. But in order to do that thing where I'm very vulnerable, um, I have to have a relationship. And if I have that relationship, then I can go in and go, hey, I, I just, I don't know, I need help. Much more than if I've never met her, I'm, she's a lieutenant. <laughs> right? And, and so I think that education and the cross education is very, very helpful. Law enforcement and CPS have to work together by law. But if they don't understand each other's roles and the difference between civil and criminal, they might step on each other. They might not be able to work together in the best possible way to make sure that children are safe. Love those. Um, so on the, on, well, on the DV side, and I guess sexual violence too, but um, one thing I think is one of the biggest things for, for me specifically is perpetrator accountability. Um, I think that that is so, so, so important. Um, I know that there are, um, at least here in the state of Florida, when we hear about domestic violence, and I'm sure this is probably where you are too, but um, when we hear about domestic violence, the first thing that we say is, okay, well, why don't you just leave? Just leave. Just you and those kids, you get out of the house. What are you doing staying there? And so what happens is we put all this weight and the burden um, of safety onto that survivor, onto that mom. So here she is, um, a mom with one child, two kids, three kids, whatever, and she's going and she's going to get in her car and just go. Well, if she had the financial resources to do that, I'm sure she would have done it already. Um, and no one wants to wake up and say, okay, I can't wait to, you know, be abused today. I can't wait for marital rape to happen. I can't wait to um, not be able to leave my home or, or pick up the phone and call my family. So um, at this time, there's so much of the burden put onto mom for keeping the kids safe, but not enough on dad for saying, okay, well, why are you hitting her? Um, why are you, why do you have an issue with power and control? What, what's going on? Um, and we put a lot of the burden on mom to leave. So here she is, she's going to leave. And where is she going to go tonight? She's going to sleep in her car. But guess what? Tomorrow, CPS or DCF is going to be called because here's a mom sleeping in the car with her children. 
So now she's in the system, right? And she's being forced to go into shelter and she has to meet all of these different deadlines or meetings or um, meet with all of these individuals and, and do this whole case plan. And then here is dad at the house. Um, and I'm sorry for the specific gendering that I'm doing right now, but um, here's dad at the house and he's still within this, he's still at home. He's able to come home and turn his lights on and off and go into the shower and come out without someone being right there. And here she is trying to see what she can do to get all these different things and goals accomplished before DCF or CPS comes and says that I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. So I think perpetrator accountability is so, so, so important for this stiff penalties and, and consistent messaging um, uh, to survivors and to uh, perpetrators that if this happens, this right here will happen. Um, so I think that's really important. Um, and so I know that I heard prevention uh, earlier come out, Jennifer. So um, prevention programming, I think it's really, really important as well. So when we think about prevention programming, I know there are so many different models, so many different studies going on right now, as far as like what works with sexual violence, what works with dating violence, what works with stalking, what works um, in general. So I think that we really need to study the ones that are working and then replicate that model or study it further and really push funding towards prevention because we can eventually get to a world where violence is not an issue, where we have an entire generation who turns on the TV and they're not seeing, um, you know, um, they're not seeing it just being the wife having to cook, having to clean, having to take care of the kids and dad comes home and he's like, Put his feet, he puts his feet up, his feet up, and he's just, you know, able to do whatever he wants to do without her having some kind of voice. And if that's the, you know, roles that you all have decided, that's great. Cause I prefer not to cook. I prefer to, I'll take the trash out and I prefer for my fiance to, to be the chef because he can cook. Me, on the other hand, not so much. I'll heat up a pizza. So, um, so those kind of things. I think prevention programming is really, really important. And then additional funding and resources to survivor programming and services. And that also includes that education piece that we were talking about that is so important. Um, and it's not just for um, law enforcement. It's not just for the legal system. It's not just for social services, but it's for those safety net services when people are getting, you know, food stamp benefits, um, you know, and people are coming in and they're having to um, automatically report to or report their abuser to child support enforcement um, in order to access uh, safety net services, in order to access SNAP benefits. Um, but what if that's not safe for them? So making sure that people within our community, the safety net services, people that are part of the system also have that level of um, engagement with one another, as Lori said, and as Katie said, that education for across all systems that everyone's getting the same type of information um, and, and that it's not just, you know, uh, the same nurses are getting this amount of information, but then domestic violence advocates are getting all of this. And then they're looking at them like, well, why, aren't, why don't y'all know that? They don't know it because they didn't receive that same education or same information. And so, or vice versa. So I think all of those things also contribute to it. I'm sure there are like a billion more things we could say, but um, I think that's that's uh, my spiel on it. Yes, exactly. I mean, I'm of course I'm biased because that's what I do is education, and that's my passion, and I and I love that aspect of it. Um, but yeah, pre um, prevention is is so important, and it might look different than just you know bringing awareness of like this is what sexual violence looks like. You know, this is what to look out for. It could also be the, what does a healthy relationship look like when you are meeting new people? How is it making you feeling? How is the relationship making you feeling if you're meeting new friends, all, all acquaintances, anything like that? So there is a lot of prevention programming out there, of course. Um, you know, we try to get the best that we can, but there there is a lot to choose from. So we we just try to do what whatever other people, I would say work smarter, not harder. So if somebody is doing something that is, is amazing and that is working for their students, it's like, I, I will take that. <laughs> um, all right, well, that, that brings us to the end of our discussion today. Does anyone have any final thoughts or anything that they wanted to wrap up with? If not, that is okay. I just wanted to kind of leave room. I didn't see any questions on our uh, comments there, but if anyone had any, if anyone's watching this later on and has questions, go ahead and comment them. We, we'll still monitor it and, and answer those questions later. But if anyone has any final thoughts, just go ahead. <laughs> You know, I just really appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this panel. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Absolutely. Yes, of course. I mean, I, I thank you guys. You guys are taking time out of your 
probably really busy days to come in here and talk to you know the viewers and, and tell them a little bit about violence against women. Um, I know we're all tired. I know it's been a really rough time. And so again, that's just more validation that you guys are awesome. And, and we really, really appreciate your time today. So again, if anyone is watching this later and needs those services, you can go on our website at sarcpv.org. Um, I'll also link um, you know, some of the other you know, websites and, and organizations that we talked about today as well, if anyone needed those services. So um, again, I appreciate everyone and I hope everyone has a great rest of your week and everyone stays safe and um, have a great rest of your night, everyone. Thank you.